It was about 3 a.m. on a Saturday night in December of 2019 when I was awoken by a rapping on my door. As I made my way to the window to see two police officers standing outside, my pounding heart sunk. They cut right to the chase. There was an accident. Your sister Alexa was hit by a car while riding her bicycle. And I'm so sorry, but Alexa was killed. As details unraveled, we came to learn that she was struck by a drunk driver while she was riding her bike home from Seven Sushi where she worked. The driver was coming home from a holiday party downtown with a blood alcohol level almost three times over the legal limit. The morbid silver lining would be that she was killed on impact. Alexa was 25 years old, an artist, a gentle soul, the baby of four sisters. I would love to spend this whole time telling you all about her. But as soon as I came to the realization just how poor we are in general about talking about grief, I vowed that one day I would talk about my own. So tonight I want to share with you how I process this loss through my work as an artist and a river guide. As long as I can remember, I've used art as a tool to work through complex emotions and somehow this became my career. In 2017, I also started working on the Middle Fork of the Salmon River guiding multi-day wilderness river trips on a 100-mile stretch in Idaho. And the left here is a photo of my mom and Alexa on one of those trips. Through this immersion in this environment, the river and white water became a natural source of inspiration for my artwork. As I began to experience firsthand the sensation of grief coming in waves, as I was very literally traveling down rivers, water in all of its forms served as my healer, my metaphor, and my muse. The first few hours after I found out Alexa had died, I never felt so lost and alone in my, my, my life. In true millennial fashion, I actually Googled how to grieve. It became almost immediately clear that this is not where I would find answers. The following night, when I finally found sleep, I had a dream that I was floating down a river on the most beautiful summer day. This painting I made years later is of that sacred dream space that offered solace at a time when it was intensely painful to be embodied in my present reality. It was my first evidence that the comfort that I sought would probably come from within. Now, I grew up in South Dakota where I witnessed many afternoon thunderstorms rolling across the prairie. Unlike cattle, who will try to move away and resist an oncoming storm, buffalo have the biological instinct to head directly into it, ultimately minimizing their pain and suffering. Resilience is accepting the wave. And I only just had this aha moment while putting together this presentation that the same is true for whitewater. A rower will generally have better results teeing up and gaining momentum to hit the wave head on. And I didn't have it so defined at the time, but this is how I would approach my grief. I would tee up, and I started with getting help. With the assistance of the Bozeman Help Center, I have fortunately found an amazing grief therapist. In our first session together, she showed me the window of tolerance, which, simply put, is the zone in which a person can manage challenges without becoming overwhelmed or shutting down. Trauma can narrow this window, leading us to being stuck in the zones of fight, flight, or freeze. As a very visual person, this helped me immensely to understand just what was happening with my nervous system, and understand that the goal was not to suppress these extreme emotions, but expand the capacity to hold them. This is the prettier version I made of the window of tolerance. In seeking help, I also joined a healing meditation group in which we visualized roses as a symbol for protection and boundaries. Through, the, through their absorbent petals and shielding thorns, with a cord connecting us from the heavens and into the earth. This is the image that poured out of me. It was one of my most successful ever pieces ever to date, both in sales and responses. You actually might have seen it. Um, it's on one of the box wraps in downtown Bozeman in front of the co-op. I attribute this response to the fact that I created it from such a very raw place, which is often the case for the music and the art that touches us most. The summers that followed working on the Middle Fork offered welcome, though not always healthy, distractions from my grief, but it was always there and would intensify when I returned home for the season. I wrote these words upon completing this piece inspired by quiet reflection in my own backyard. Here it is again, the season of remembering. For months on end, I've soaked in a salve made of sunshine, but inevitably the light fades earlier each day. In twilight, my teeth clench, my heart tightens, a heaviness sets in behind my eyes. And when I walk, I listen, and she was always there. In the sway of the cattails, the ripples in the pond, 
the crystallizing of my breath and the soft gravity of the snow. There is comfort in sorrow. Shortly after Alexa died, there was a ghost bike placed at the crash site, a white bicycle memorial. It was eventually removed, leaving me unsure how to nurture my nervous system as I pass that intersection nearly every day. So as I approached the three year anniversary of her death, I decided to paint the memory of the ghost bike. Now, as I started this process, I deeply questioned what the hell I was doing. Why would I subject myself to hours in front of a canvas, revisiting the site of her death? But sure enough, tears began to flow alongside the paint, gradually melting the eyesight built up in my veins. If there's anything I've learned about transcending pain and suffering, it's that time and timing are everything. Almost everything. I have to mention the incredible network of people that intuitively knew how to help or hear or hold me. And I'd venture to guess everyone in this room tonight is experiencing some sort of grief. I just want to say you're not alone. There's no conclusion to the story. I will likely carry this grief for the rest of my life, but I'd like to leave you with just one more river metaphor. In Swiftwater 101, you learn that waves in a river are formed by gradient obstacles and constriction. This is why an old, wide, and deep riverbed holds very tranquil water. And it's not that there aren't years of floods and other natural disasters, and that things aren't constantly still moving and shifting underneath. But when these events do happen, the water always finds a way, sometimes even creating new channels that provide nourishment to the ecosystem. So if you can allow time to erode your banks and settle your depths, you arrive in a window of openness and awareness that can hold it with compassion. When you start to become like that old wise river, you're not so bothered by the waves. <laughs>